Okay, so we're starting for today's lecture. Here's just a recap of what's due. I know I had due dates on the vocab and the genetic disease projects, but if you get them done before those due dates, uh, get them to me as soon as possible so I can start grading. All right, so we are going to continue with chapter 14 today and get as far as we can. I'm still planning to have lecture on Thursday and then the test will open up after lecture on Thursday and you'll have 24 hours to take it. So we were talking about the central dogma and talking about transcription and how transcription works within both a eukaryote and a prokaryote. We talked about that there's just basically one major enzyme that's involved. What's that enzyme called? RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase, and it and it reads just one strand. It doesn't have to do both, and it reads in a, a one direction only. So it's very much like DNA polymerase. It can only read the parent strand three prime to five prime, and instead of building a DNA molecule, it builds an RNA molecule. Only the length of the gene, so however long the gene is. And remember, we talked about the parts of the gene, the the promoter which is the on-ramp where the polymerase binds and then so do all the transcription factors. And then we talked about the coding region, which is actually what has the instructions that are gonna be made into a protein or an RNA. And then we have the termination sequence, which is basically the off-ramp to get off, okay? And we talked about um, the fact that the parts of the gene correlate to the stages of transcription. So the initiation part happens at our promoter, the elongation part happens during the coding region, and then the termination part happens at the terminator sequence. I also want to remind you of this picture, um, that it's it's not just an easy, oh, RNA polymerase is around, we're going to make this gene um, transcription happen, that there actually has to be a lot of components in place to make transcription work. And so we have these transcription factors, which are proteins that bind to the promoter DNA sequence. And they're kind of there a lot of the time, and they're just waiting for a go signal from these activator proteins, which bind to other DNA sequences called enhancers to give the transcription the final, yes, it's time to go, let's Let's do this thing. Let's do the central dogma. Okay. So, um, so I wanted to kind of remind you of that. We're going to see a little bit more of that as we go into chapter 15. So we'll review that again. All right. So let's start with now that we've made the RNA. If we're in a prokaryote, the RNA that is made can immediately be translated. There's no nucleus, there's no separation of where the DNA is and where the ribosomes are. So it can happen simultaneously. So you can see in this picture right here that the, the pink RNA is still being made on the DNA and ribosomes are already jumping on and making proteins, which are these purple things being pooped out, all right? In a eukaryote, it can't happen simultaneously. First, the RNA has to go through what's called processing before the RNA can leave the nucleus. And there's no ribosomes in the nucleus, so translation can't start until the RNA gets out into the nucleus. So they are definitely not coupled in that sense. They're not happening at the same time on the same RNA transcript in a eukaryote. So what we have to do now is we talked about transcription where we made this RNA now we have to talk about how we're going to process it so it can leave the nucleus. So this processing is required for the RNA to leave the nucleus. It is, um, if you think about the proteins that sit at the nuclear pore, those nuclear pore proteins, I kind of think of them like bouncers sitting at the door of a bar, and they're only going to allow mature mRNAs to leave and go out into the cytoplasm. And so if there is not, uh, if the mRNAs have not been matured, they will not allow them to get out, all right? 
So they have to go through this processing to become mature. And the processing happens in three steps. We're going to add something to each end. We're going to add a cap to the five prime end, which is basically just a, nu a, a G nucleotide. We're going to add a tail to the three prime end, which is a whole slew, hundreds of adenine nucleotides. So now I think of it as looking like a little mouse. It has a it has a, a head and a tail, okay? And then we are going to do something called splicing, all right? So splicing, if you think about <coughs> like when a movie producer makes a movie, they make all these different scenes and they record it all these different times. And then at the end, they remove parts that that maybe weren't meaningful or made the movie too long or someone messed up or there was someone weird in the background and they cut those pieces out all right and then they put the the movie clips back together in such a way that you don't even ever notice that there was something missing and the movie just flows beautifully from scene to scene and you don't even necessarily know that there's something been removed we're doing that same thing with our rna there are parts of the rna that actually don't contribute to the final movie, to the final RNA that's going to deliver the message. And we're going to have to remove those parts and put together the meaningful parts um, so that we can make the protein that we really intended to make. All right. So, um, so these three things have to happen so that the RNA can get out of the nucleus. It also helps protect the RNA from enzymes that might want to degrade it. So if a, if a cell sees just random RNAs floating around in its cytoplasm, it might go out and think, oh my gosh, this is viral or something and chop it all up. So these ends tell the, the enzymes, no, no, these are the good RNAs, don't chop us up. Okay, and then it also helps the ribosomes attach to the proper side and make sure everything's working right. So when we first get our RNA, all right, we are going to add this five prime cap, this poly A tail, right? And then we're going to cut out the pieces that we don't need. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about some of these words that are here because we're going to come back to them in a second and you'll see them on some slides. So what we're going to find out is this region right here was our coding region. We're going to cut some of that coding region out. And even after we cut some of the coding region out, there are still going to be regions right here and right here that will not be translated, all right? So we call those regions the untranslated regions, the UTR, the untranslated regions, all right? So there's one on the five prime end, so we're not gonna translate the cap, and then we're not gonna translate this little part, and then there's one at the three prime end, and then we're not gonna translate the tail, all right? So there are parts of the even after we're done cutting it all up, there's still parts that don't get translated. All right, so what does this process really look like? Well, basically, when we're building that coding region, we have some parts that we need and some parts that we don't. The parts that we need are called exons. So think of them being the parts that are expressed. They're the parts that are going to make the protein. And then in between those exons are regions of DNA or RNA sequence called introns. The introns are in the way, all right? They're not there to give the code. They're just in the way, so we have to remove them, all right? So when we transcribe the DNA and we make the RNA, the RNA is also going to contain those exons and those introns. All right, so once the RNA gets made via RNA polymerase and transcription, then when the RNA is released, we're going to immediately add a cap, that's a special G, and a tail, a whole bunch of A's, and then we're going to cut out these introns. We're going to cut them, cut the RNA, and then we're going to put the exons back together. We're going to splice them back together. So notice... The mature mRNA, the one that actually is done being processed and the one that can leave the nucleus, is shorter than the original RNA, 
which is shorter than the original gene because the original gene still has promoter sequence over here and terminator sequence over here. So the original gene in the DNA is pretty long. The RNA we make from is shorter. Then we process the RNA and it gets even shorter. All right, everybody see that? So we're removing the introns, they're in the way, and putting back to the, together the exons so we can express them into protein. Now, how do we do this? Well, obviously there's going to be enzymes involved, okay? And the, the um, body of um, machinery that does this in our cell is called a spliceosome. It's somewhat similar to a ribosome in the sense that it's made up of both proteins and RNAs, functional RNAs. All right, these functional RNAs are called small nuclear, I'm sorry, small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SNRPs. All right, SNRPs. And these, um, as you can see here, they're red. The SNRNAs are red, and they fold back on themselves via complementary base pairing. All right, and I said that wrong. The, the RNAs are called SNRNAs, small nuclear RNAs, and then the proteins are called small nuclear ribonuclear proteins. So you have both of those there. All right, so here's what happens. We finally make the RNA. We're still in the nucleus. The spliceosome pro, um, complex is going to come together and recognize the boundary between the exon and the intron. So in this picture, the intron is this orangey color, all right? It's going to recognize the boundary. And these RNAs, the small nuclear RNAs that are part of the spliceosome, help direct that recognition. You can see here how there's some complementary base pairing going on here and some here. So they help everything line up. Then these have catalytic activity, all right? They're able to do something. So what they're going to do is they're actually going to cause a cut to happen here and a cut to happen here. They're going to cut out that RNA and then they're going to actually put together the two exons that are that are left and you can see now that the big intron is removed and the two exons are now together okay so are those hydrogen bonds between the snRNA and the mRNA yes they're hydrogen bonds it's complementary base pairing um, no there's not really specific spliceosomes for every gene that are that's coded um, the intron sequences have um, sometimes very common start sequences. Does that answer your question, Seth? All right, so we can't leave the nucleus until we, we complete these steps. But once we're complete, that RNA is gonna leave the nucleus. And where is it gonna go once it leaves the nucleus? What's it gonna go find? The ribosome. The ribosome, because the ribosome is responsible for the translation part. All right, so this RNA processing is something we haven't talked about before. Um, this is new to the whole central dogma idea, but it has to happen in a eukaryote for those RNAs to leave the nucleus. So here's just another picture. So here's my, my original um, mRNA that's made. It's often referred to as a transcript. We have exon, intron, exon, intron, exon. The spliceosome comes in, loops out the intron, cuts it, and then puts the exons back together. And you can see here how this messenger RNA that we made is shorter than the original RNA that was made. We typically call the original one the pre-mRNA, and then the final one is called the mature mRNA that's ready to leave. All right, so remember, this is really important that genes are long sequences of DNA, not super long, but they're sequences of DNA that some parts of the gene are going to be um, transcribed, other parts aren't. So the promoter doesn't get transcribed and the terminator doesn't get transcribed, but the coding region does. And then there are parts of the coding region that get translated and there are parts that don't because we cut them out or there are not translated regions. So that's important to remember. All right, so this is just an interesting little piece of statistics. In some genes, 
more than 90% of the pre-mRNA is spliced out. So they never, that part never makes it to the mature RNA. So you might think, well, why is that so? Why, why do we do this? Why are they, these exons and introns present? Like, why don't just put the DNA together in such a way? Well, it wasn't necessarily clear to biologists initially either. And when we sequenced the DNA, I'm sorry, when we um, figured out the structure of DNA in 1950, people started really studying DNA and started really starting to understand the central dogma and how the, the genes uh, were dictating what proteins were being made. And it started a conversation about how many genes there must be to code for all of these proteins, right? And the original thought was that every protein had its own unique gene that went along with it. So for example, when I was in freshman biology, I learned that one gene equaled one enzyme. That's what, and it was like something we had to know. It was like a, a rule. Well, 50 years ago, so I was in college in 1990s, right? So by the year 2000, we sequenced the human genome. And it turned out we didn't have millions of genes because we have millions of enzymes. It turned out we only had about 25,000 genes. So that was a really big conundrum to biologists. How do we have millions of proteins and only 25,000 genes when genes code for proteins? So that kind of made no sense in their heads. So it turns out it's these introns that give us all of this variety. All right, because what we can do is we can do something called alternative splicing. So we can take a gene that has these particular enzyme uh, exons in them, and we can splice them in different patterns to make different proteins that maybe are similar a little bit in their function, but are not exactly the same enzyme doing the same exact thing. So for example, if you look at this one, we have six exons. We could splice out all of the introns and have all of the exons, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, that's not even here. They don't even have that one. So we could have that one, right? We could splice it in such a way that we splice out the intron between one and two, but when we splice out the next intron, we take three with it. So now we have exons one, two, four, five, six. We could splice it in this way, one, three, five, six. We could splice it in this way, one, three, four, five, six. This allows a whole bunch of kind of similarly functioning, but not exactly the same proteins to be made from one gene. So that whole idea of one gene equals one enzyme was to totally debunked by the time I got to graduate school. So I was in freshman biology in 1993, and I was in graduate school in 1997, and within those four years, everything kind of went out, out the door. So this is why sometimes we, we think we know stuff, and then when we get pushed to the limits, we find out, oh my gosh, there are some things we didn't really know. Okay, so our alternative splicing allows us to make a greater number of proteins from single genes. So one gene makes more than one protein. Okay, so I have some questions here. Um, is it always linearly made? Like, would you have a string of one, six, two, three, four? Um, that's a really good question. I think no. I think it is linear. So I think you wouldn't put, you wouldn't flip around the six to be before the two. And we're going to talk about what what these domains are or what these exons represent in just a second. Okay, so let's consider a protein. We've talked about proteins a lot this year. Um, in particular, we've talked about proteins that are kinases. So what does a kinase do? Just as a reminder, help you study for the final. It um, moves ATP to where it needs to go. It, it moves not the whole ATP, what part of the ATP? A phosphate group. The phosphate group, right? It does phosphorylation, exactly. So here we have a protein that has kinase activity down here. It also is a transmembrane protein. So we've talked about what that means, right? You have to have alpha helices and has to be able to fit in here. And it also looks like it's some sort of receptor protein outside of the membrane. So we've talked about receptor proteins too. 
So this particular protein has to have kind of three different important domains. It has to have kinase activity. It has to be able to be transmembrane, and it also has to act as a receptor. Um, here's another protein. This protein has kinase activity right here. This protein binds DNA right here. So here's a kinase that has to go to the membrane. Here's a kinase that has to be bound to DNA. All right, so how might that actually help? Well, if you can imagine, uh, hold on, I'm gonna go forward, that those exons represent these different domains. I'm gonna go back. So maybe an exon represents kinase activity and a different exon represents transmembrane activity, and a different exon represents receptor, and a different one represents DNA binding. So if you were to, to put them together in different ways, let's just say um, one is the kinase activity, three is DNA binding, and four is transmembrane, all of a sudden we can have a kinase that goes to the DNA, or a kinase that goes to the membrane from this just one transcript. Can you see how that might be? So what it's come down to the thinking is that each exon basically codes for a domain or a particular activity that the protein itself does. All right, so let's look at some protein domains, and you don't have to know all of these. It's more of the big picture that I want you to know. So here are a bunch of different proteins. ABLE, we talked about um, BCR ABLE, so this is very much like the BCR ABLE protein. Um, let's see, I guess we haven't really talked about any of these other ones, but these are just a whole bunch of different proteins. And when you look at the proteins, they have different binding or, I'm sorry, different um, activity domains of the protein. So for example, this one has a kinase domain and DNA binding activity. So this would be a kinase that binds DNA. So maybe some sort of transcription factor of sorts. Um, let's see, um, looking for something real quick. Um, Notice these all have a kinase. I'm just looking for one that looks like transmembrane domain. Maybe they don't have anything. Here's one, CDC42. So what does that remind you of? What's a CDC or CDK? A cyclin uh, yeah, a cyclin-dependent kinase. So do we have one up here? So here's one that is a kinase that is capable of binding to cyclin. So that one's involved in cell cycle, right? Um, and so you can see that from one transcript, we can kind of use together in different ways to make all of these different kinds of proteins. By the way, the mic's off. Uh oh, someone have a question? Or is that just someone else talking? Um, that was my Google Home Mini hearing our conversation. Oh, <laughs> okay. So um, the exons code for different domains in a protein, and exon shuffling, that alternative splicing we talked about, is really what's um, leading to evolution of new proteins when we start mixing them around and making these different combinations. So for example, we know that to bind to DNA, you have to have this special um, motif called a helix, and then it turns in a very specific way, and then it has another helix that goes. It helps it fit into that double helix. Um, structure of the protein, of the, of the DNA, sorry. So there might be a very particular exon that codes for this secondary structure of the protein that gives it that, that capability of binding DNA. All right, does anybody, as you guys see that, do you have any questions about that? So this is just, a, you can just see how many different domains proteins have. These are all kinases and then look at all the other weird domains they can have that cause them to be part of particular um, functions. So Juan, too many questions not to ask? You can go ahead and ask. Yes, I'm gonna have to read, read back up. I don't know, I just feel like I got lost. 
Okay, well, the important part is you make this RNA and then we're gonna cut pieces out, but we're not always gonna cut it out the same way. And when we cut it out different ways, we can make different proteins that go and function um, differently in, in um, the cell. Because remember, kinase activity is a pretty standard activity. We're gonna move phosphate groups. But sometimes we have to move a phosphate group when we're bound to DNA. Sometimes we have to move a phosphate group when we're bound to actin. Sometimes we have to move a phosphate group when we're at the membrane. Sometimes we have to move a phosphate group when we're in the extracellular matrix. So it just depends on what kind of protein you're going to end up being as to what different parts of that protein you're going to have put together. And it goes back to those exons. Okay. And it could be that it's spliced differently in different cell types at different times of, of development. Those are all different possibilities. Okay, so that's called alternative splicing, how we can get multiple different proteins from one RNA. Okay, so can I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell this story really, really quickly. Um, so this relates to my own research when I was in graduate school. So I studied uh, a protein or a gene really um, called ASH1 and my, advisor had been studying it for many, many years, and he was convinced it was a transcription factor, okay? Because when, when you messed up ASH1 and it didn't work, proteins weren't made that were supposed to be made for proper development, okay? So he thought for sure it was a transcription factor. And for decades, and I mean, he was, when I was in his lab, we, he had been working on the same protein for 30 years, all right, so older than most of you, for decades, he was struggling to find how and if and where this particular protein bound to DNA. And we could never find it. So when I was in the lab, I worked on it too, all right, and I had gone to a conference. And when you go to biology conferences, um, there's a poster session similar to what we would have done if we had a normal poster session for the semester where graduate students present their work. It's not really published yet, but they're on their way to being published. OK, so they they make a poster. Here's what my findings are so far. And then people go around and read their posters and ask them questions. Well, I was walking around the poster session and I saw that um, someone had a poster and they were talking about a domain of their protein called the set domain. And the protein I was working with also had a set domain. And their research showed that the set domain was something that could methylate histones. So let's think about what that means. We talked that about that just a little bit. So first of all, what are histones? Um, protein protein and that DNA is wrapped around. That's right. Proteins with DNA is wrapped around that we make chromatin out of, right? And if we modify those histones, remember we can change the architecture of the DNA, right? We can make it be really tight like heterochromatin, or we can make it loose like euchromatin, right? Now, what's the methyl group going to do? Is it going to make it tight, or is it going to make it loose? Tight. It's going to make it tight, right? Because a methyl group is is hydrophobic, so when two of them come together, they're going to pull everything together. Those hydrophobic regions are going to be interested in each other, right? So this group that I was um, looking at their poster had shown that their protein that had a set domain was contributing to chromatin changes, not binding DNA and causing transcription changes. So I went home and I told my boss, I said, I'm pretty sure maybe we've been looking for the wrong thing. We've been looking to find this protein bind DNA. Well, what happens if it binds to histones and still affects gene expression, but not by binding DNA directly? And he said, you're full of it. I've been studying this for 30 years, but prove me wrong. And so I went and designed all these experiments, and it turned out I was right. 
that the protein wasn't a DNA binding protein. It ended up being a histone binding protein and it controlled transcription by changing the chromatin architecture, not by binding DNA directly. So this is just an example of how important knowing what those domains are and how they work can be to figuring something out about what that protein does. All right. So he was happy with me. He wasn't mad at me, by the way. He was glad we figured it out before he retired. Okay. So, um, so anyway, back to transcription. We went to here, we, we processed that RNA. Now we're ready for that last step called translation. All right. And this step's not necessarily super easy e either because of the fact that we're changing languages. We're not going from nucleotide to nucleotide anymore. We're going from nucleotide to amino acid, which are completely different building blocks. We can't use the same method to do it. So remember, when we went from DNA to RNA, we were able to use complementary base pairing as our method. We can't use that method anymore. So instead, we have to read things in a different way. So instead of reading one nucleotide at a time, we end up reading three nucleotides at a time. So three nucleotides are called a codon. All right. And three nucleotides, one codon codes for one amino acid. So it has to be CGU to be this amino acid. If it's UCA, then it's this amino acid. If it's UGG, then it's this amino acid. Does that make sense? And I'm not really sure that's those are the correct amino acids, but that's what it would be. Now, how do we know which one codes for which? Well, this took scientists a while to figure out, but they actually figured out that it's called the genetic code, right? That tells us what combinations of nucleotides in the RNA code for what particular amino acid in the DNA. Now, if you think about the fact that there's four nucleotides and 20 amino acids, you had to have at least 20 possible combinations. So two nucleotides per one amino acid wasn't enough. So there had to be three, which means when you have three possible nucleotides, we had 64 different possibilities. So sometimes the codons are redundant in the sense that this UUU, for example, and UUC both code for the same amino acid. All right. Sometimes it's just two codons for one amino acid. You can see here this one has four for one amino acid. This one has six that code for one amino acid. So it just depends on which one's which. This code is universal, nearly. Um, there are bacteria that do some weird things which um, means if you put UUU in an mRNA and you put it in any other organism, that organism is going to know to put a phenylalanine in that position. That's pretty cool, right? So this is a universal code. That would be the same with... Say it again? Sorry. I was just going to say, so that's the same for all the start and stop codons in every organism? Yes. There are some bacteria that are a little bit exceptions, but yes, for most organisms, 99.9% .9 of them, they use this code to the T, right? And so what Juan was just putting out was this start codon. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But the start codon is always going to be the first codon that codes for an amino acid. So we'll get to that in a second. So this is basically where the protein is going to start on the mRNA. And then when it gets the mRNA gets to a, a stop codon, and there's three possible ones, UAA, UAG, or UGA. Those are going to tell the ribosome it's time to stop making this. So remember, three nucleotides code for one amino acid. All right. And we don't um, do any sort of um, skipping. So it's the first three and then the second three. So we never skip one or overlap or anything like that. It's, it's three to three. And that's important because this sets up what's called our reading frame. So once we know where we're starting, then it's just every three after that from that point forward. Now, how do you read this code in case you don't know? The rows indicate the first letter. So row one here, everything has U in the first space. You can see the red color. 
The columns represent the second letter. So along here, everything has U in the second position. Everything in this column has C in the second position. Everything in this column has A. And then, of course, in each square, there are four, which are going to have the other um, possible nucleotides paired up with them. One of the things, if you look, if you study this a little bit and you start looking at it carefully, that you see is that when there's overlap, the first two letters are often the same, and it's the third letter that is different. So for serine, you don't really need this third letter to be correct to get serine. As long as you have U and C, you're going to get serine, see, because there's no other U's and C's anywhere else here. Does that make sense? And same with proline. As long as you have C, C, you're going to get proline. However, for U, U, you can't just go with any old third one. It has to be the right one because U, U, U and U, U, C tell us phenylalanine, but U, U, A and U, U, G tell us leucine. So sometimes this third position doesn't matter quite as much. So we call this the wobble position. It can be a little wobbly, but other times it matters absolutely like in the terms of AUG, which codes for methionine, which is our start codon. Okay, so where does this reading happen? This translation happens at the ribosome, right? So we have to talk a little bit about ribosome structure and what's going on at the ribosome. So first of all, the ribosome has two subunits. It has a large subunit and a small subunit. And within that, there is a binding site for the mRNA that came from the nucleus, and then the tRNAs that are helping process the RNA. All right, the tRNAs really are, in my opinion, the most important part of all of this. And then don't forget that the ribosome itself is made up of proteins and ribosomal RNAs. So there's a lot of RNAs going on right here when we do translation. Okay, so we've talked about the mRNA. We talked. We need to talk a little bit about these transfer RNA molecules. So first and foremost, let's remember where they came from. Transfer RNAs have a gene that codes for them, but they function as an RNA. So they never get made fully into a protein. So sometimes some genes code for RNAs just as is. So the tRNAs that we have are single-stranded because RNAs are single-stranded, but they fold back on themselves like this and take on basically a secondary structure, all right? So these are complementary base pairings between the folded parts of the mRNA. So this is what's keeping it in this secondary structure, okay? And I think this is easy to remember because it kind of looks like a T. Um, so we saw the same kind of secondary structure with the spliceosome RNAs. Okay, so oftentimes when an RNA is functional, it folds on itself like this and it functions in that folded way, similar to like how a protein has to fold to be functional. So the important parts of this tRNA are up here at this end where you have the gray three nucleotides, okay, and then down here at this bottom loop where you have these green three nucleotides down here. The tRNA's job is to read the RNAs on the mRNA. I'm sorry, the nucleotides on the mRNA via these three nucleotides down here. So these three nucleotides here are going to be complementary to the codon in the RNA, in the mRNA. So if they're complementary, what would be the mRNA sequence along here? What would pair with this A on the mRNA? So imagine, good, U, right? So it would be U, U, C, exactly. So that would tell us what would U, U, C code for? Phenylalanine. So this particular tRNA is going to recognize U, U, C on the mRNA. And then over here where these gray three nucleotides are, these are going to actually um, bind or covalently bond to the phenylalanine amino acid. So this tRNA is the coolest thing ever because it knows how to read the mRNA and knows that it's bringing the right amino acid in. Now, how does it know? Of course, 
there is a process and an enzyme that does this, okay? So um, I'll get to that picture in one second. This is just what I just showed you. This is kind of more how it really looks, and this is how it looks in all the pictures we're going to be talking about. So this is where it binds to the amino acid. These are the three that bind to the codon. So I have a funny story about this. this these three down here, these three green ones, they're referred to as the anti-codon. And every year it always makes me think of something that my, one of my kids would say, because it's not the codon, it's the anti-codon. It just sounds like some like superhero thing. So I gotta tell you a funny story. When Jackson was little, Jackson's very bright with numbers and math, and he always was. And he was, I don't know, he was very little, maybe four. Um, and he wanted to know what a negative number is. And so we started telling him and we said, okay, well, if you have three apples and I take away an apple, how many do you have left? And he said two. And I said, okay, you have one apple and I take an apple away, what do you have? And he said zero. And I said, well, if you have one apple and I take two apples away, what do you have? And his little brain, he sat there and he thought, he was the cutest little kid ever, he thought and he thought, and he looked at me and he said, ultimate zero? <laughs> so this just makes me think of the anti-codon, the ultimate zero. So this is just the complementary to the codon. Okay, so I'm going to skip that slide just one second. I'll come back to it. So how does this tRNA get paired up with the amino acid? Well, it goes through an enzyme. So the enzyme is called amino acyl tRNA synthetase named for what it does. It is an adding an amino acid to a tRNA through the synthesis part, right? So this enzyme is going to bind the amino acid. It's going to get phosphorylated to get it active, and it's going to bind to the tRNA, all right? So first, it's going to first recognize the tRNA and the amino acid so they fit properly. Sometimes that wobble comes into play, doesn't have to necessarily know that third base properly, right? And then it's when it's called charging the tRNA, charges it with that, that um, amino acid. All right, so if we go back to this picture now, you can see here's a charged amino acid. It's coming in. It's recognizing the codon with its anti-codon, right? And then it's going to eventually join up with the rest of this growing amino acid chain going to have an empty amino acid, so it's going to go off and get recharged so that it can be used again. Okay? All right, so that's called charging. So let's now talk about how the translation part all gets put together. So in our ribosome, you can see here there's kind of three little silos. Okay, these are the binding sites for the tRNAs. So typically at, one, at any one given moment, you have about two tRNAs bound in there. One in the P site, which is P because this is where the growing peptide will exit. And one at the A site, which is called A because that's where the newest tRNA is going to be accepted. And then the empty one that doesn't have an amino acid anymore exits through the E site or the exit site. All right. So what happens is a new one comes in, recognizes its codon with its anti-codon, bringing the correct amino acid. What's going to happen is we're going to take this whole growing chain of amino acids, transfer it to this amino acid. This now tRNA is going to be empty. It's going to move to the exit site, and this guy's going to move into the P site, leaving the A site empty again. And it's really not the ribosome moving. The RNA gets tugged through it. So think of it like the RNA or the ribosome is, is stable and in position and the RNA is getting pulled through it. All right, so let's see how this really works step by step. So the first thing that happens after the RNA is processed and the mRNA is processed and it leaves the nucleus, it's floating around in the cytoplasm and a small subunit of the ribosome is going to bind to the five prime end. That's where the cap is. Okay, the, the G cap. And it's going to start to scan the mRNA. It scans along, scans along, 
scans along until it finds a start codon. So remember, the start codon is A U G. So nothing happens to these nucleotides before the start codon. So that was that five prime untranslated region I talked about earlier because we don't actually translate them because they are before the start codon. Once we get to the start codon, the tRNA that recognizes that start codon will bind, bringing the proper amino acid, which is methionine. Then the large subunit will come and assemble on top of it. So this is the first part of translation. This is what's called initiation to start it all out. Now we're ready to go. So now we have the next codon available and an empty slot for a tRNA. So now we're going to start actually building the protein and going through what's called elongation. So that next tRNA is going to come in, recognize its codon, bind. Then we're going to transfer the growing amino acid chain to this new amino acid that was brought in. Then we're going to tug that RNA to the left, right? Sorry, there's the tugging. The empty tRNA is going to pop out. The one with the growing chain now is here. We're leaving the next site open for this to happen again. So for every new amino acid that gets added to the chain, we're going through this, these stages of elongation. So basically, if you have a protein that's 100 amino acids long, you would go through 99 rounds of elongation because the first amino acid would have come from initiation, the very first one. So is the GTP the modified G that is put on the 5 prime end? And does it act like ATP? Oh, okay. No, the GTP is like ATP. It's just, it's just powering um, the uh, ribosome's movement. It's just using ATP instead of ATP. And we didn't talk too much about that, but when you get to the next biology course, you'll talk more about how GTP works because we didn't do any signal transduction. But it's just another um, energy carrier. Okay, so then how does it know to stop? Well, eventually, we're going to get to one of those stop codons. Remember UGG or UGA, UAG, and UAG, UGA. All right, we're going to get to one of those. And instead of a tRNA coming by here, we're actually going to have what's called a release factor, or this little yellow silo come and bind. And that basically says, hey, we're done. We don't need to do any more. The peptide will get released. The tRNA is going to go get recharged. The RNA is going to get released. And everything is then sent back to be reused again. We can reuse the small subunit. We can reuse the large subunit. We can reuse this mRNA. We can transfer it again. The protein goes off and folds, right? So everything kind of gets recycled here. All right. Any questions on the, the stages of translation? We start with the small subunit binding, coming to the start codon, tRNA binds, big subunit comes. Then we just start reading three at a time, three at a time, three at a time, building that polypeptide till we get to the stop codon, and then the release factor comes in and we terminate the whole process. Any questions? We're gonna watch a video, so hopefully we'll get to see it in more real time. Um, one of the things we've talked about is how important it is that we can amplify a signal so we can have a cell say, we need this protein, and in minutes we make millions of copies, or seconds we make millions of copies, this is one of the ways this can happen, is you can have multiple ribosomes reading one um, mRNA at the same time. So you can see here, in this particular case, this one mRNA is making four proteins. But if you look in this real image down here, look how many mRNAs, I mean, I'm sorry, how many ribosomes are reading this one mRNA all at the same time. So if we just were to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I might be counting something that's not really there, 17 ribosomes from one mRNA. So that means from one transcript that we made, we get 17 copies of the protein like that. 
All right, and we can still read that mRNA again, and probably we didn't just make one mRNA, maybe we made 10 of them. So we can very quickly get our, our, our purpose amplified. Okay, so don't forget that we're not really done with the protein when we get that primary sequence. So the ribosome speaks about the primary sequence, but remember we have to do secondary folding, the alpha helix, the beta pleated sheet, we have to do tertiary folding, right, so that we can get it in the right shape. It may need to go be um, partnered up with other polypeptides to be quaternary structure. And still we're not done because then it has to be localized. Is it supposed to be in the membrane or outside of the cell or in the cytoplasm or back in the nucleus? So it's got to get to this proper place. And then we've talked about how sometimes they're made in a form that doesn't isn't fully active yet. So maybe, okay, we finally folded it, we finally localized it. Now we're waiting for that moment to be activated, right? So it can it can change its shape just so now it can do what it needs to do. So we have a lot of tight control over when and where and how this protein functions. Don't forget about the um, the secretory pathway, right? So if the protein is made initially and it uh, has a little signal peptide that says, hey, you're supposed to go through the secretory pathway, that's going to be what targets that ribosome to dock onto the ER and then the, the finishing prop, um, steps of that protein synthesis are done in the ER through the Golgi pathway. Don't forget also, if it's a membrane protein, it's going to be packaged in the membrane of the ER and in the Golgi before it even gets to the plasma membrane itself. So the reason I bring that up is because they don't always just have a sequence at the beginning that tells them where to go in terms of going to the ribosome. They also have maybe some sequences that tell us if we're cytoplasmic where we're supposed to go. So for example, there might be a few amino acids that say, hey, you're a nuclear protein, go back to the nucleus. You might have a few amino acids that say, hey, you're supposed to be in the peroxisome. You might have a few amino acids that say, hey, go to the mitochondria. You may not have any leader amino acids, and so you just stay in the cytoplasm and do your job. So those first amino acids often play a very important role in where they're localized. So you can imagine that being an exon. That first leader sequence could be an exon. So if, it's, if you're supposed to go to the nucleus, you're going to get exon 1 as your first exon. If you're supposed to go to the mitochondria, you're going to get exon 2 as your first exon. Does that make sense? and not exon one. Yeah? Okay. Um, and then keep in mind that proteins can be um, modified after they've been translated. So this would be kind of a post-translational modification, something that happens to the protein after it's been made. And we can do lots of things, for example, Add a phosphate group, add a, a sugar, right? Add a group called ubiquitin. This one targets proteins for destruction. Um, we could add an acetyl group. We talked about that. We could add a methyl group. So that's why we learned some of those really important um, functional groups because they really can change the activity of protein based on its. I feel like I have something under here. Oh, I do. Okay, that just popped up on top of it. Okay. Sorry, I could see these bullet points and I didn't know where they came from. Now, here's just another little aside. Um, many antibiotics target bacterial ribosomes. So even though bacteria have ribosomes that function very much similarly to eukaryotic ribosomes, structurally they're a little bit different, they're smaller. And so many antibiotics will target specific ribosomes for bacteria and not ribosomes for um, eukaryotes. So that's how when you take an antibiotic, it doesn't hurt your own cells, um, but it kills all the bacteria in your system. So these are some that you've may, maybe heard of. Um, streptomycin, it blocks um, the small subunit from binding to the RNA properly. Um, maybe you've heard of tetracycline. That one interferes with the tRNA 
um, anti-codons pairing with the mRNA codon. Um, some of you, I think maybe in your lab projects, used chloramphenicol, and that prevents the large subunit from um, allowing a peptide bond to form between the growing amino acid chain. So that's how amino uh, antibiotics work. Um, sometimes they block cell wall synthesis, sometimes they block folic acid synthesis, and this is another way they function. Okay, any questions on translation? It's very hard. It's very hard. Okay, well, let's watch a movie. It's not really that hard, but there are some more details that we haven't really seen before. So let's see. Where's my movie? There it is. So we're just going to watch this. It's like three minutes. Um, it's going to start with transcription and go the whole way to translation, just so you can kind of see it in real time. I might pause it and say things along the way. Keep in mind, look around, see what you see. Like in this picture right here, I can see lots of ribosomes reading RNAs all at the same time. These little things are the tRNA, so you'll see things floating around. Okay, here it goes. This student is cramming for her biology test with only a frosting-covered donut for lunch. Specialized cells in her pancreas respond to the increasing amount of sugar in her blood by releasing insulin, a small protein that regulates blood sugar levels. Let's go inside one of these cells to see how this protein is manufactured. Okay, keep in mind, insulin goes outside of the cell, so it's going to go through the secretory pathway. So she's probably going to use that pathway to talk about this. The instructions for making insulin are coded by a segment of DNA in the nucleus. In transcription, an enzyme zips along the DNA, forming RNA, shown here in red. RNA nucleotides line up with their complementary DNA partners, transcribing the information in DNA into RNA. Okay, what, what enzyme was that? She didn't tell you. RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase. And you could see in that video how there wasn't very much of the DNA that gets separated, and it's not very much of the RNA that stays hybridized. The DNA goes back together pretty easily, and the RNA kind of drifts off. The information in DNA into RNA. As the RNA grows, it is processed in several ways. First, a modified guanine nucleotide is added to the beginning as a cap. <laughs> also, a segments of the RNA strand that do not actually code for the protein are removed, and the remaining segments of RNA are reconnected. Okay, what are those enzymes called? Is it the tRNA? Nope. We're not to the ribosome yet. What causes splicing? The spliceosome. Good, 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 good. Finally, extra adenine nucleotides are added to the end of the RNA strand forming a tail. The completed messenger RNA, mRNA, now leaves the nucleus. The messenger mRNA is translated into a protein in the cytoplasm. First, a transfer RNA, tRNA, arrives, carrying a specific amino acid. The small subunit of a ribosome attaches to the mRNA. Now, the larger subunit of the ribosome attaches. Notice it, did, it, it didn't bind at the very beginning three nucleotides. It had to read along till it found that start codon. What's that start codon again? AUG, that's right. Now, don't worry. On the test, you will be given a genetic code. You never have to memorize that. But it's always good to know that start codon. Just keep makes it easier. A second tRNA docks, bringing another amino acid. The ribosome helps to form a covalent bond between the two amino acids. What's that bond called? Close. That's what the whole growing protein chain is called. What's the bond? Yeah, just a peptide bond. That's right. The mRNA shifts and the first tRNA leaves. A new tRNA brings another amino acid. The ribosome helps to form a new bond 
and the process is repeated. Notice that one end of a tRNA molecule has a set of three bases called an anticodon that pairs with complementary bases on the mRNA. The other end of the tRNA carries a specific amino acid. Different types of tRNAs carry different amino acids. What's the min minimum number of tRNAs you have to have? 20, that's right. And probably that, that is probably the case because of wobble. You don't have to have multiple ones, like if serine has four different tRNAs that fit, any of those three tRNAs will be um, charged by the same enzyme likely. In this way, the message in mRNA is translated into a specific sequence of amino acids. For proteins that will be secreted from the cell, like insulin, the ribosome docks on the rough ER, and the protein grows into the ER compartment. The new protein molecules are packaged in a vesicle that is transported to the Golgi apparatus, where many proteins are processed. However, insulin is packaged in a vesicle that leaves the Golgi and is then processed. Proteins secreted from the cell are shipped to the plasma membrane. Here, insulin is secreted from the pancreas and begins to regulate the student's rising blood sugar levels. Did that help a little bit, seeing it in kind of real time? Yes? Okay, good. Excellent. All right, so we have a little bit more to talk about um, in chapter 14. So what I told you before, remember that this process, the whole idea of the central dogma is universal, which means you can take uh, the gene from a firefly that codes for the firefly's glowy butt and put it into any other organism and express it as long as you have the right now think about this in terms of all of the control we have over it. You have to have the right promoter or a promoter that's going to make sure it's expressed. And then you have to um, have the right transcription factors to make it expressed. One of the things you can do easily if you want to express this gene somewhere else is you find a promoter in this organism, in the plant, and put this gene under the control of that promoter. So now the plant is not going to know what gene it's making. It just knows that it's supposed to make bind to that promoter and make that particular protein. So you can you can actually control expression through changing the promoters around. OK, so. So let's answer these questions. Um, what is the relationship between genes and traits? Is it great when a gene is expressed? Okay, so when genes are expressed, they influence the traits. That's right. Genes code for the traits. That's exactly right. Good. Um, so genes tell us to what proteins to make, and those proteins control our traits. Um, so we talked a little bit about enzymes. Uh, I'm sorry, ribosomes. Oh, not too right. RNAs. Sorry, we talked a little bit about RNAs having their own. Um, job and sometimes RNAs can act as enzymes in the sense that they can um, cut something. All right. So when we call a ribos an RNA that is capable of cutting something, we call it a ribozyme. All right. And it basically can um, cut things. All right. And so these are becoming more and more um, obvious to us as ways the cell regulates gene expression. So you can imagine if it's if the RNA was made and has been being made into protein, at some point we need to degrade that RNA to slow down the protein production. Well, these ribozymes will recognize their RNA, bind it, and then cut it up to pieces, which will then be transferred to the lysosome to be further broken down into their building blocks. So this is um, RNA is controlling 
how much RNA is actually present in the cell at any one given time so that we're not overproducing proteins that we don't need to be making. Okay, so we've talked about um, the genetic uh, processing of all of this, and I think we talked a little bit about sickle cell. Did we talk about sickle cell? Yeah or no? Yes. Okay, so remember, you, sickle cell comes from the gene for hemoglobin, right? So normally we make hemoglobin, and they, they uh, fit into a red blood cell that looks like this, when we have a mutation in the DNA, the hemoglobin doesn't take on the right shape and it causes the red blood cells to look like this, all right? So, so let's talk a little bit about mutations and the kinds of mutations there are that then code for these different kinds of changes in the DNA. So the first thing I want to talk about is just the general word mutation. And mutation means there's a change in the DNA sequence. It can be come from lots of different sources. UV rays, radiation, um, smoking, chemicals, asbestos, right? Those kinds of things that all kind of mess with our DNA can cause mutations. And one of the kinds of mutations we're going to talk about are called point mutations. And this is where you just have a change in one base at a time, all right? So we're going to talk about different kinds of point mutations that cause different kinds of outcomes, all right? So one kind is called a substitution. So you have one nucleotide that is substituted for a different one. So there's still the same number of nucleotides, just supposed to be CG and now it's TA. Or you can have ones that are either insertions or deletions. So now you have more nucleotides, a different number of nucleotides, and you're either inserting or you're deleting uh, nucleotides. All right, so let's talk a little bit about each of these. And we're going to use our hemoglobin gene as our example. So here's our normal hemoglobin DNA, which makes this mRNA, which makes this normal amino acid chain. In hemoglobin, one amino acid, I'm sorry, one nucleotide is changed, and that causes one amino acid to be changed. And we already know that that causes the whole protein to fold wrong and the cell to be wrong. So there's different kinds of um, point mutations that are substitutions. So we're going to talk about three different kinds, silent, missense, and nonsense. And do you have to know the difference between them? You absolutely do. Okay. So silent mutations, let's see. Well, I'll read this. We'll read this together, and then we'll look at the example. Silent mutations mean that there is a change in the DNA. But because of the redundancy of the genetic code, there's no change in the amino acid sequence. All right. Whereas a missense mutation is a change in the DNA that results in a change in what amino acid gets put into the amino acid sequence. So you can see here we changed the DNA, but no difference in amino acids. Here we changed the DNA, and we did get a difference. A nonsense mutation, so don't get missense and nonsense mixed up. A nonsense mutation means we change the DNA, one nucleotide, but that one nucleotide change results in a stop codon. So there's a pre-mature uh, ending of the protein. All right? So silent means it makes the same amount amino acids. So even though there's a change, it's still a mutation because there's a change. It's silent because we don't, we don't see it. Nonsense means we actually make a stop. And missense makes, means we um, change the amino acid. Now, is that always bad? Well, here you have two different kinds, conservative and non-conservative. It depends, right? If you were changing from a lysine, which is shown right here, to an arginine, they look pretty much the same, don't they? So the cell might not really care and fold it the same way. The protein might fold in the same way. However, if you change from lysine to threonine, this looks pretty different. And so this, the protein may not fold the same way. All right, so I want you to be able to distinguish one from the other. So a new, so and if we have a change in the DNA that doesn't change the amino acid, that is a silent mutation. 
it's still a mutation because there's still a change in the DNA. If we have a mutation that does change the amino acid, so notice we were met lice phi gly, now we're met lice phi ser, that's a missense. We're getting a different amino acid. It may fold the same, it may not. We don't know how it will function yet because it depends on what amino acid it changes to. This is what happened with sickle cell. It was a missense mutation that did cause it to fold a little funny. And then we have a nonsense mutation. So instead of met lice phi gly, we have met stop. Well, that's obviously going to be a non-functional protein altogether. Everybody see the difference between the three? Any questions? All right, now insertions and deletions are way more tricky because now we're going to be either adding or losing a nucleotide. And the reason why these ones are tricky is because we're going to basically alter what's called the reading frame. So I'm going to pull up another picture I, I have here. All right. So you can imagine if this was my normal sequence and these were my, um, you know, amino acids or mRNAs or whatever, but it read this way, the one big fly had one red eye. Right, a missense mutation would just change it like this E to a Q. So it's like duh, one big fly had one red eye. You, you probably would maybe figure it out, maybe not. A nonsense mutation would stop it early. So one big and then nothing else, right? A frame shift mutation is going to add a letter in in such a way that it's going to shift all the letters down one, right? So now everything after that insertion doesn't make sense anymore. So instead of saying the one big fly had one red eye, it's going to say the one who down air day, right? Doesn't make any sense anymore. It's still making protein, but not the right proteins and the right amino acids in the right order. Or as if you had a deletion, right? Um, you could have a deletion of three nucleotides, or you could have a deletion of two nucleotides. I'm sorry, if you had a deletion of three nucleotides, you might just delete one whole amino acid and it would still maybe be okay. But if you had a deletion or insertion of one or two, then that really becomes problematic. All right, so let's go back to the other PowerPoint. Okay, so here's an example. Here's where you have an insertion of just one nucleotide that causes me to have an early stop codon. So frame shift mutations can result in nonsense mutations as well. Here's where I delete one. And so notice if I delete right here, I'm going to change every single amino acid after that. Maybe never even get to a stop codon because now I've ruined that. All right. However, if I delete or I insert in sets of three nucleotides, I may not have as big of an effect than if I do it one or two. So insertions and deletions of one or two nucleotides are far more dangerous than an insertion of three. Because I still have, I'm missing the lysine here, but I still have everything else in the right order. And who knows, maybe it'll still fold correctly. Okay. So those are um, our kinds of mutations that I want you to be able to tell the difference between. And like I said, things that cause these mutations are called mutagens, which are basically physical or chemical agents that basically just intercalate into the DNA and cause these changes in the DNA sequence. Things like smoking and radiation and things like that. Okay, so that is the end of chapter 14. Um, I guess I have like four more minutes. I'll, I'll kind of, I have some questions in here. I'll kind of go through some of those questions. And then um, my plan is to still hold lecture on Thursday. We'll go through 15 and then we'll have the test starting after lecture on Thursday. Okay, so this is just a review slide kind of showing you all of the various things we talked about with transcription, processing, translation, charging, splicing, all of those things. Okay, so let's look at this question. A mutant bacterial cell has a defective 
amino acid synthetase that normally attaches lysine to the tRNAs with the codon AAA. In, oh, I'm sorry, it, it mutant attaches lysine instead of its normal phenylalanine. So it's supposed to be phenylalanine, and instead it attaches a lysine. So what will the consequence be? Is it A, none of the proteins in the cell will contain phenylalanine? Is it B, the protein in the cell will include lysine instead of phenylalanine anytime there's the codon UUU? The cell will compensate for this defect by attaching phenylalanine tRNAs to lysine specifying anticodons. The ribosome will skip every time a UUU is encountered, or none of these things will happen. The tRNA will get destroyed. What do you think the answer is? Okay, I got a B. Another B. Good. B is the right answer. So AAA is the anticodon, which means the codon is UUU. And UUU is supposed to be phenylalanine, but it made a mistake, and so it put on the lysine. So every time it hits UUU, it's going to be a lysine instead of a phenylalanine. Good. Okay. Enhancers are A, adjacent to the gene they regulate, B, required to turn on gene expression when transcription factors are in short supply, C, the site on DNA to which activators bind, D, are required to facilitate the binding of DNA polymerase, or E, the product of transcription factors. B? No, it's not B. Because remember, it has nothing to do with transcription factors. They have to bind the transcription factors, so they all need to be present. Um, no, it's not D. Transcription factors are more important for the binding of the DNA polymerase, not the, en not the enhancers. C. C, right? Remember, enhancers are DNA, and proteins bind to them called activator proteins. So the answer is C. So make sure you, you know the difference. Promoters and enhancers are DNA sequences to which proteins can bind, transcription factors bind promoters, activators bind enhancers. So keep that in mind. All right, RNA splicing involves A, the addition of a nucleotide cap, the addition of a nucleotide tail, Removal of introns, removal of exons, or addition of introns. Okay, I got a C. Another C. Everybody agree with C? That's exactly right. Removal of introns. And sometimes it takes some exons with it, right, if we do alternative splicing. Okay, which of the following permits a single gene to code for more than one polypeptide, right? Retention of different introns in the final version, alternative RNA splicing, protein degradation, genetic differentiation, or addition of different caps and tails. Good, alternative splicing. Why is uh, A not right? Anybody? Well, we don't include introns ever. Right? So sometimes we remove, yeah, introns are non-coding. Good job. Okay, in the structural organization of many eukaryotic genes, individual exons may be related to which of the following? A, the sequence of the intron that immediately precedes each exon, the number of polypeptides making the, up the final protein, the various domains of the polypeptide product, such as a kinase domain, the number of restriction enzyme cutting sites, or the number of start sites for transcription. <laughs> 
Nope, it's not D. Nope, it's not B. So it doesn't it doesn't affect the number of proteins being made. What does one exon code for? Nope, it's not A. We're we're narrowing it down here, peoples. What do you think it is? Exons dictate what in the protein? Not E. Nope. <laughs> I thought for sure it was going to be the right one. So we've eliminated them all down to C, right? So remember, the exons are what code for those domains, like the kinase domain or the DNA binding domain, and different exons code for these different parts of the protein. Okay, that was my last question. So, like I said, we are going to still have lecture on Thursday, and I will open up the test after lecture on Thursday. It'll be open for 24 hours. You'll still get two chances to take it. Uh, if, if you absolutely know I can't take it between 2.30 on Thursday and 2.30 on Friday, you need to let me know so that I can schedule a different time for you to take it. OK, um, I have to leave my office hours early today. So um, if you have any questions, come on early. I have to leave about 2.20. So make sure you come on a little bit early. Is anyone intending to come to office hours today? I just don't want to miss anybody. You can always email me if you don't catch me. I know a lot of you have lab anyway. OK, so keep studying. Um, I know we covered a lot today, but in it's 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 fun. Think of it as being fun, and um, just keep reading over it. You'll get it. Okay, I promise it'll start to click. Ivan, question. Will chapter fifteen be on the test? It will be, but not very many questions. But it will be. So make sure you've uh, read it before you come to class on Thursday. Okay. Okay. So I'll see you guys all on Thursday. Email me your questions if you have questions. OK? OK. All right, you're free to go. Go to lab. You people who have a lab, don't be late.